everything's in place. And uh, today's topic is called hashtag you're it. And I don't really know what hashtag, I know that people put it in front of, I guess, Twitter accounts or something like that, but I wanted the word tag, you know, tag you're it. So I put hashtag you're it. I do want to welcome our visitors that are here, especially first-time visitors. I know that I have a couple friends that have come, especially today. And I'm just so thankful for Mike and Bev to uh, give up their own home church this morning just to come be supportive and to be with us. So we, we welcome you. Our pastors are out of town this week, so we hope you come back another time and meet them. <laughs> Uh, but this is a day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. I mean, just writing those things down in my notes made me excited. I thought, oh, God, this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. And um, so anyway, I always like to start out when I talk, I start out with a few grandma jokes. They're jokes that I share with my grandchildren. Not many this week I, just because I've got a lot to say. I don't want to take up the time. But I did choose five. You know, the grace, the grace number for today's <laughs> delivery. And I'll give you five fingers to answer if you should happen to know. Anyway, why is Alabama the smartest state? Because it's got five A's and one B. <laughs> what, what kind of a driver doesn't need a license? A screwdriver. <laughs> what does a pickle say when it wants to play cards? Deal me in. <laughs> what do you call a polar bear with earmuffs on? Anything you want. He can't hear you. <laughs> One more. What do you get when you cross a four-leaf clover and poison ivy? A rash of good luck. <laughs> okay, so tag, hashtag, you're it. You're it. You're hired. You've got the job, you've got the position, I choose you. That's what God's saying this morning. And I'm going to take a look at that with, um, in three different sections. I call them whack. <laughs> Words, authority, and courage. So you can kind of be listening for those. Um, in Genesis 1, 1 through 13, I mean 1 through 3, excuse me, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. So I want to talk first of all about our words. Because our words are full of light, energy, power, all these building blocks to get the job done, whatever that job is in your particular area of what God's calling you to do. And recently I heard a message by Amy Barkman on those three words, and it fascinated me. The scientific definition of light is energy and power. The scientific uh, definition of energy is light and power. The scientific definition of power is energy and light. <laughs> All together, a threesome. Isn't that interesting? Light, energy, power, all one. This is quantum physics. <laughs> Way above my head. Don't worry, we're not going to go deep. I'm not going to put you to sleep with that one. But <laughs> quantum physics says that matter, the, for matter to exist, it must have three forces. For something solid to happen, it has to take these three forces. One force is nu the nuclear force, atomic particles. N nuclear force, atomic particles. In the beginning, God created. The second force is gravitational forces, vibrating, movement. The Holy Spirit hovered over the earth, vibrated, shook. And the third one, electromagnetic forces, are sound waves. The sun spoke, light be. Quantum physics. So I have a little demonstration for you. And I'm hoping this simplistic, very simplistic demonstration is going to help us gain some understanding of how God has equipped us and is working in and through us. 
God created atomic particles, okay, we've got that established, with all the possibilities of matter that can become solid in the physical realm. All the materials are made up of atomic um, particles. So I've taken a few atomic particles here, just a few. I mean, everything. Here's atomic particles, there's atomic particles, those chairs. Everything is made up of atomic particles. Well, I have chosen for this little simplistic demonstration to choose these atomic particles. So we have some uh, shake and bake. We have some black beans. We have a couple of eggs. We have, and my husband thought to have them hard boiled. <laughs> so I wouldn't make them, he knows I could make a mess really quick. Um, some oil, uh, some golden corn, a cake mix, and a bottle of water. So these are atomic particles that God has created. Now the Holy Spirit is coming and he's, oh, he's looking over these. And he is, remember, he's the movement. He's the gravitational force. But he's waiting to hear the word of what, how God wants him to move and unite these gravitational forces. So the word spoke. Jesus said, cake B. So the Holy Spirit comes over here and, let's see, God said, cake B. And the Holy Spirit takes them, and he stirs them up, and he shakes them up. And he puts a little heat on them, and voila, we have cake bee. <laughs> so that's my, my little simplistic demonstration of the three forces that make, uh, make matter move and how they line up with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That these are the elements of light, life, light, energy, power. You know, God spoke us into existence. God's constantly creating through us and in us. In Colossians 1.17, it says, Christ holds all creation together, upholding all things by the word of his power. His word through us turns light waves into particles and possibilities into realities. <sighs> he made us. He gave us his Holy Spirit to live within us, and he speaks life to us and through us, our words. Remember, sound waves cause the vibration of particles. Our voices have an impact on the life around us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Light changes things. Light affects energy. It can become energy. Light can become a solid particle. You know, Tim referred a couple weeks ago to our hearts being like solar panels. I love that. Oh, I love to be out in the sun and receive. But our hearts like solar panels. And he says that the light gives us the capacity to know who we are. The capacity to understand that all of this is working within us. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the, uh, the atomic particles, the vibration, and the power of our, of our voice, the power of, of sound that we are his creation, empowered by his Holy Spirit to hear his voice and obey it. So we're to speak powerful words, to release healing, to change the circumstances around us. You see, we've got all that it takes. He's given us all that it takes for this. And the darkness, you know, darkness can't cast out darkness. Darkness can only be cast out by light. And we've got the light. So we've got the power to cast out the darkness. Your voice is powerful. I want you to hear that this morning. Your voice is powerful. So you want to use it to articulate and demonstrate who he is. In Matthew 21, verses 19 to 21, as a story of the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree, telling about Jesus. It's not a story. It's a real thing that happened. So Jesus is hungry, and he's walking along, and he notices a fig tree by the side of the path. And he walks over to see if there's any fruit on the fig tree. But there's none. It's only leaves. You know, it kind of reminds me of how people sometimes appear to be something they're not. They're created, but they're not speaking the word, and they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to move in them to bear fruit. So here's this fig tree that's just there. Looks like it should be doing something, but it's just there. So Jesus spoke to that fig tree, and he says, You will be barren and never bear fruit again. And it says, Instantly, the fig tree shriveled up right in front of our eyes. Well, of course, Jesus was using these harsh words appropriately. But to me, I caught something there, that this is a picture of how powerfully withering words can affect things and circumstances and people. Proverbs 18, 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. 
We can speak and create life, or we can speak and create death. Our words can be creative, or they can be destructive. Light, energy, light be, energy be, power be, to create good and destroy evil. In Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, Receive this truth. Whatever you bind or forbid on earth will be bound or, for, or forbidden in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. Matter hears words. Matter hears words. Joshua 24, now we just saw that the fig tree heard Jesus say, You're done. <laughs> Joshua 24 says, just, this is just before Joshua died, he gathered all the Israelites and he led them into covenant to serve the Lord. And he took this huge stone and rolled it beneath the terebinth tree and he said to them, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us and it will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. In Luke 19.40, the Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke the crowd for praising him as king. And he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road will cry out. They will burst into cheers. To matter, listen, matter hears words. Matter responds to words. Mark 11, 22, 23, Jesus says, speak to that mountain. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 23, watch your words and be careful what you say. You'll be surprised how few troubles you'll have. James 3, 6 and 9, the tongue is a fire. Use your tongue to praise God our Father. We use our tongues to praise God our Father, and then we turn around and curse the person who's made in his very image. We're living in the midst of a war of words. We're, listening, we're in a, a war all around our world. You know, physically there's wars going on. But right here where we're walking today, we're in a war of words. The words we're speaking, the words we're listening to, the words we're letting into our spirits, the words that we're letting come out of our mouths. Everywhere we turn, there's negative words, there's negative energies and powers struggling, buying for our mind, our emotions, and our, and our bodies. And we have got to shut the door to all those voices of worry and fear and hate and anxiety and offense. We have got to shut the door. In uh, 2 Kings 4, uh, chapter 4, verses um, 1 through 7. Uh, I knew I was going to need to use these. I tried to skip out and I have to wear because I don't want to look so young. But um, vain, vain, vain. Okay, so Matt, uh, I didn't even turn to the right one. What did I just tell you? Second Kings, not Exodus. It's not in Exodus. It's in Kings. We're going to Exodus later. Okay, so Second Kings, chapter 4. One day the widow of a member of the group of the prophets came to Elisha and he cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord, but now the creditor has come threatening to take my sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors, and then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. And so she did as she, she, did as, each, as she was told, and her sons kept bringing the jars to her, and she filled one after another, and soon every container was filled to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her son, sons, and they said, there aren't any more. And he told her, and then the olive oil stopped flowing. And when she told the man of God what had happened, he said, now go sell the olive oil, pay your debts, and you and your son can live on what's left over. She had to go in and shut the door. She couldn't have her neighbors, her relatives, her friends saying, oh, what are you doing, you crazy woman? <laughs> what do you think you're doing? Are you praying oil into jars? <laughs> she had to shut the door on any of the negativity that would come against her. In Proverbs 21, 23, it says to watch your words and be careful what you say, and you'll be surprised at how few troubles. I already told you that, but I thought I'd tell you again. Evidently, the Holy Spirit wants some of you to hear that again. <laughs> okay, later in that same chapter in 2 Kings, there was a woman that came to Elijah, and her son had died. And Elijah went. He went to the room alone, and it says he shut the door and the child lived. 
So th we have illustration after illustration in the Word of the saints of God, believing the Word of God, understanding who they were in Christ, scattering the enemy's frequency. See, there's an enemy frequency there that we're shutting the door to. We're to scatter the enemy's frequency with our tongues and with our obedience. Fear, stop right there. There's no room for you in here. I shut the door to you. Hate, stop right there. You're not welcome. There's no room for you in here. I'm shutting my door. Okay, the second part that I wanted to share with you is about our authority. Now we know about how powerful our words are, but now we've got to use them. And I wanted to take a look now <laughs> at Exodus that I had marked. Um, and in 14 verses 13 through 16, we're looking at Moses here. And we're looking at where the um, Israelites had fled. They were flee fleeing from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, they see now that Pharaoh's chasing them. And they're starting to get a little antsy about that. <laughs> and they get up to the, to the water. And uh, they tell people, they tell Moses, let's see, did I want to start? Yeah, I want to start at 14. Um, Moses told the people, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. You know, God told them to do all this. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Okay, God's got this. I heard that somewhere this morning. And then in verse 15, it said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get up and get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea and divide the water and blah, 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 and you all know what happens after that. But the point is that God had a, point, a, play, a part to play, a big part to play, but so did Moses. Moses had to step out in his authority. He had to pick up his staff and get moving. God's done a lot for us, and he's waiting for us to get moving, to pick up our staff and get moving. In Job 15, 12, or in Job 15, it tells us that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And together, we bear fruit. Together. We have authority together with him. He overcomes the world through us. Yeah, Jesus overcomes the world. He does it through us. You know, the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word made flesh is in us. It's a partnership. You know, there's a very real sense that we're transitioning now from the sword to the spirit. We're transitioning as a body of Christ into ruling and reigning with him. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says that we are ambassadors seated with him in the heavenlies. Seated. You're all seated. You're sitting You've taken a load off. <laughs> you're relaxed. I'm up here sweating, but you're relaxed. No. <laughs> but there's a, <laughs> there is a, but see, that, that's a war, a war of rest. We, we, we are at war when we're resting. We're at war against the enemy because we're not listening to him. We've shut the door on him, and we're resting in God's love, in his peace, and his joy. And that's where our strength comes from. Did you ever hear the joy of the Lord is our strength? You know, we, and we're ambassadors of him. We're, we are extensions of him. We are his scepters poured out, laid out for others. Remember Esther, the book of Esther, that uh, she wanted to go ahead and see the king? And you couldn't just show up and say, hey, king. You had to be invited to come. And if you did show up, if he did not extend his scepter, it would be off with your head. But his, when he extended his scepter, his grace, his welcoming, then you came in. Well, we are God's scepters. We are his offering out to those who don't know him. We are the ones to lay down our lives and welcome them in, welcome home, come on into the throne room, <laughs> the throne room of God. Scepter means uh, emblem of royal authority. It just said that we were his ambassadors. We are his scepters. We are emblems of royal authority. It's not just our authority or some authority. It's royal authority. Yeah. We can extend that scepter in intercession. That's a big area where God is calling us, drawing us to these days, to intercede, to be able to intercede, to lay out that scepter for people. We watch and hear what God's saying. We expose evil and mobilize with that scepter. This transition phase is we're coming from being warriors to, and not that we won't, be, but you, know, it, you have to see the bigger picture. He's calling us into being rulers. 
some of us have gotten so warrior in, <laughs> you know, and that's a good, there's a, there's a place for that. But he's calling us more into ruling, yes. ruling out of peace, ruling out of authority of who we are in him, that royal authority. You know, it's just like, have you ever tried to pull a door that you were supposed to push, that you couldn't get in from pulling it? You're supposed to push it? Okay, well, yeah, you're supposed to go through the door, but the old ways aren't working. We're trying to push some doors that we need to pull. We're trying to pull some doors that we need to push. Jesus is shaking up the game. He's changing. He's doing a divine makeover in the church. He's doing some rearranging and repositioning in his body. John 8, 4 through 11. It's a woman caught in adultery. I absolutely love I never saw this before, and I got it from somebody. I don't know who. I listen to a lot of prophetic people. But anyway, you all know the story. Well, maybe you don't. Some of you might not. I think I might read it to you. <laughs> John chapter 8, verses 4 through 11. This isn't John chapter 8. Catherine, get with the program. Okay, I found it. Verse 8, I mean verse 4. Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what would you say that we do with her? And they were only teasing Jesus because they had hoped they were going to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the law of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that he answer their question. So Jesus stood up and looked at them, and he said, let's have the man who's never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And he bent over and wrote some more words in the dust. And upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience, until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman, still standing there in front of him. And so she, he stood back up, and he said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. And Jesus said, Then certainly I don't commend you either, condemn you either. Go and from now on be free from the life of sin. Look what Jesus did. I hadn't seen this before. He broke off the judgment of their speech against her. He overturned the law. He superseded the law and demanded that that demanded that she be stoned. He superseded that law. And he changed the atmosphere over her to love and forgiveness and peace. Words, powerful. And he basically was saying to the men, take, take that plank out of your own eye before you start accusing your brother and your sister. You know, how we treat others, what we say about them, is to reflect God's grace, his mercy, his love, his heart. You know, settle it in your heart. You are on assignment. <laughs> and it is to live and, and speak and take authority like Jesus did and not let things that seem, well, it's the law. She's breaking the law. You know, what about the guy? Anyway, she's breaking the law. See, that would, in the natural up here, it's thinking, well, yeah, the law says she should be stoned. Jesus said, no. No. I love her. I forgive her. I, I supersede that. I change the atmosphere with my words. He didn't get in a fight with those guys. He didn't punch their lights out. He convicted them of their own sin. And he freed her with his words. And we're to be like, we've got the same material, the same light, the same energy, the same power, because he's in us, because he's in us. So stop looking behind you and don't <laughs> overthink it. Trust God to hold on to the why. Why would he do that? Let God hold on to the why. Lean not to your own understanding, Proverbs says. Well, there's an example of leaning not to your own understanding. Take authority. 
You know, when we think we hear that term taking authority, we think like, okay, I'm going to take authority. I'm in charge. <laughs> when Jesus says take authority, he's saying humble yourself. Humility, choosing to depend, be dependent on God and not doing what is right in our own eyes. That's humility. That's taking authority. He says, here is your robe of righteousness. Here is your ring of authority. Here is your staff, your light, your energy, the power of God. Now, walk into that throne room with confidence. Not your confidence. Your confidence in the king. You're getting truth. Take it. Don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Let it go into your heart. Let it make a difference that you've been here today, this day, hearing his word afresh. Some of you have heard this over and over. You know the word. But we need to keep being reminded because we keep being reminded of all the yucky stuff the enemy wants us to. So we need to be reminded. It's time to clean house. In 1 Peter 4.11, it says, If you have a gift of speaking, speak as though God were speaking his word through you. That is a command. It's not saying you might. If you have the gift of speaking, you speak as though God were speaking his word through you. Go look it up. 1 Peter 4.11, that's what it says. It's a command. Jesus says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. We know he said binding and loosing, but he gave us a whole lot more than that. He gave us a whole lot more keys. You know, keys, are some, of us, some of us lose our keys. I can't find my keys. I know that I put them here somewhere. I purposely put them here so I wouldn't forget and I wouldn't lose them. But it's time to go. And I can't go because I don't have my keys. Ask the Holy Spirit, you know where they are. Will you show me where they are? I do that all the time. And all the time, he shows me where they are. And I get to go. But do you know, you're not going anywhere without your keys. You're not going anywhere until you use them. Keys. He's given us the keys to the kingdom, and we are to use them. And if you have lost them, if they have gotten dusty and put away in a drawer somewhere you can't find them, ask the Holy Spirit, and he will help you go and find them. Yes. That you can take those keys and use them and make a difference in this world. The last area I want to talk to you about is courage. And... It's like, all right, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room. What elephant? <laughs> and then, you know, the elephant we don't talk about in church. The elephant that stirs us up out there, but we don't talk about it in church. Or we don't do really much about it at all. It's our government. And you notice I said our government. It belongs to us. And although most of us don't act like it, we're supposed to be stewarding it by God's grace and taking care of it. You know, God just drew our attention to the fact that he created us, gave us power of words and authority with the expectation that we were going to overcome the enemy. Now, we can spiritualize that when we need to. But there is a very real sense of walking this earth and in our day-to-day -day lives of what God, what's happening in our country and put those things that he's taught us to work in the natural realm. You know, he calls us to be overcomers. Well, that takes place here on earth, you know, where the rubber meets the road. We're not going to have anything to overcome in heaven. <laughs> but we can earn that distinction here. We can become overcomers here. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And a lot of us stop at that point. It says, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. They didn't love their lives so much that they were to step out and maybe get persecuted, maybe somebody not like us or talk back to us or whatever, fight with us. <laughs> they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die to self. But we Christians, for the most part, we, we don't want to do anything with our government. <laughs> we consider it a dirty job. Uh, we no desire to engage in it. You know, we'll just judge it and complain about it and, or stick our heads in the proverbial sand. Well, newsflash. The chaos that we have today in our United States is a result of the church not being involved in our government. 
of not, of not standing for righteousness. We as a church have ignored or judged the few righteous ones who have entered into the Colosseum. And we stand by and we watch from afar as they get mauled and eaten by the lions. You know, I came across a, a, just a little clip, a two-minute clip by Joyce Meyer online last week. And she said, um, awful wicked, wicked things are being done in our world. And she said, God, you could do something, but you're not. And he replied, I work through my people. I'm waiting for my people to become activated and rise up. We're not waiting on God. God's waiting on us. He's waiting on us to put those keys in the lock and turn them. You know, be willing to believe and look at the bigger picture of what he's tainted for us this morning. Remember that you have the power and the light and the energy that's needed for whatever task he's leading you to. It's a matter of perspective. You know, folks, you, we can't watch mainline news, listen to mainline radio, read mainline newspapers and surf social media and not get sucked into fear, hatred, character assassination, and lies that are peddled there. If that's what we're listening to, reading to, watching, that is affecting our lives. It's affecting our DNA. It's affecting our perspective. we got to shut the door. Believe me, the main line is the same line. It's propagated by a handful of elites who own and operate all the mainline media. And I can back up everything I'm saying with facts. If you're interested, I can find it for you. Their goal is power over you. It's called mind control. Their intentions are to affect the sound, the emotion, the thoughts that dramatically shape things. You know, taking the news, uh, that news in changes our DNA. It affects our organs. And we're being bombarded if we allow ourselves to be. But see, that's why there's so much angst and, and turmoil and why we don't want to talk about it because we've all heard this crap coming in. And the greater, greater percentage of it is not true, right. is twisted, and it makes you end up hating this one or judging that one or whatever. Is that what Jesus did? Is that what Jesus would do? You know, Lance Wano gave an accurate analogy of the church, dancing and dining on the Titanic, soaking in our personal circumstances. And we must wake up to what's really going on in our country and what part the church is to play in saving it or we're going to be doing our soaking in icy, deep blue seas. You know, Paul's ship was saved because he was on it. And he had a date with destiny. And so do you. You have influence. And God is calling you to get on board and use your influence. Particularly, on his heart through me this day is in our government. You know, complacency is a powerful tool to be unengaged and indifferent you know, John 3.16 said, God so loved the world, and he intends for us to love the world as well. It's love that makes the world go round, right? Well, indifference is just the opposite of love. Did you know that? Hate is not the opposite of love. Because to hate something, you've got to really care about it. Indifference, you just, oh, well, you know. If it's somebody says something to me that I don't really care what they think, <laughs> but if it's somebody I love, it makes a difference. So, in, so the opposite of love is indifference. We want, to, uh, we want change, but we want to be comfortable where we are. And we're not desperate enough to sacrifice our own comfort, our own ways, our own time, our own energy. You know, we cry out for the fire of God to fall. Well, my Bible says the fire falls on sacrifice. In the Ara uh, Ara Aramaic language, love means to start a fire. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's a sacrifice to go into battle when we don't feel like it or when we're afraid of it. And why would we be afraid of it? We have everything we need. And uh, this is an interesting verse I found, Revelation 21.8. The cowards are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Something to think about just reading the scripture. Go into the enemy camp and contend. You know, God is saying very clearly to us, get outside your comfort zone. You are called to the battlefield, not the play field, not the playground. Finally, there are, uh, no, to find, we need to find godly news outlets and, and pray the news. You know, there's a lot of stake for the future of our nation right now. This is a very serious time we're in because it's a disengaged 
that are destroying America. Passivity leads to death. And what causes passivity? The lens that you're looking through. Are you looking through judgment, offense, fear, criticism, unbelief, doubt? What are you looking through? Blinders cause wrong perception, and they cause the fire to go out. There are several noted statements that statesmen who have declared that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now, we easily can paraphrase that to read, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that the people of God do nothing. I want to read to you a quote from Tim, Tim Cole, from my, uh, April 26th. He had on the Daily Devo Devotional. He says, our personal shortcomings influence our confidence when it comes to outreach. We've been lulled into complacency, believing our greatest effectiveness will only be realized when we arrive at that place of perfection. We're already righteous. A powerful messenger is your willingness to demonstrate what an authentic journey of salvation looks like. Even though we may face our own storms, that should never be an excuse to bury our head and hold our tongue. That's a quote from our pastor. We need to repent for not stepping up to the plate and being engaged in the battle. The humility of that repentance ushers in a unity and it encourages us to press on knowing that we're forgiven. Some are looking for escape routes, for Jesus to come back and take us away. Oh, come, Jesus, come. We're ready. Let's go. But I want to tell you that before he comes for us, he's coming through us. You want him to come to us? I do too. But he's going to come first through us. Isaiah 60 says, uh, Arise and shine, for the, Lord, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. <laughs> <laughs> don't whine saying what will be will be, you know, who am I, what can I do? Declare, this is what will be. Yes. Because we're being deployed. We're not, we're, we have been through basic training, many of you, we went to that last year. What's that for? To equip us. To equip us what? To come here on Sunday morning? <laughs> we're equipped to be deployed out into the world. You know, government can't know what's right without the church telling them what it is what God's will is, God's, what God's way is to handle it. You know, it might look like uh, we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by him. <laughs> I love that song. So don't allow yourself to be weary and disheartened. Don't allow your buddy next to you to be weary and disheartened. You know, encourage one another. Step it up. Embrace the challenges by laboring together in prayer. You know, power is multiplied when we come together in prayer. We come together in agreement. Agreement is powerful. This is a communal project. We're in this together. We're to fly united. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll take a drink. <laughs> when we tilt our prayer shields together, each one of them has a different facet. Catherine's prayer shield looks different than Janetta's prayer shield. That looks different from Mike's prayer shield. That looks different from... Yours and yours and yours and from all. Each one's different. It's like the facet of a diamond. But when we hold our prayer shields together, with each with a different facet, the enemy goes totally bonkers, totally in confusion. He runs and buries his head and goes, oh my, what are they doing? Intercessors intercept <laughs> and change history. And we have that before us, even this day. We have the ability of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ to change history. We are now, this day, in the valley of decision, in a fight for our right for religious liberty. This is not an exaggeration. We're on, it's on the line right now. California, just this past week, their state senate just this week passed a bill to ban the Bible. The battle for America will determine, be determined by those who show up, who get involved. You know that there have been elections that have been won by as little as 136 votes? You think your vote's not important? It, every vote is important. You're needed on the wall today. Your vote is crucial. Your prayers are crucial. Yeah. Recognize your place of influence. We all be different. Besides voting and prayer, which we all need to be involved in, God might be showing you something different. Maybe you're supposed to go to Frankfurt and walk those grounds, which we're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> 
It might be going to make an appointment and going and visit your senator or your representative and just lend, not to beat up on them, just to share with them where you're coming from, what God's word has to say about different issues. I made my first letter to the editor. It was published in the Jesmond Journal last week. <laughs> But it's going to be different. You know, it might be helping to support somebody that's running for an office that you know is a good person, a God that's going to vote godly ways. Get out and support them. You know, go to a ring, you know, call, make phone calls, whatever. Fill it up, stuff to go in the mail. There's a myriad of ways. So God's not calling you to do everything. He's calling you to do what you can do where you are. Recognize who you are, where you are, and take your place of influence because our obedience actually embodies God's word. There's one area that I want to touch on before I close here on this, that um, the war on our children, that's heavy on my heart. I have my grandchildren are pretty much, my youngest one is in middle school, so it's not as, anyway, they're getting good teaching at home. But the United Nations, there's two organizations in the United Nations, UNESCO and UNICEF, that are United Nations Child Education Services. And they're pushing sex education in the schools, and the parents are not allowed to remove their children. And this education is going under many different names, health education, family life, rape prevention, da-da-da-da-da-da. But I'm telling you, fourth graders, I'm telling you truth, fourth graders are encouraged to view graphic photos of sexual relationships. They're, they have pictures of the gender bred man. They are learning how to apply condoms to a plastic organ and give instructions on sexual relationships. And I'm not comfortable listing this and probably you think that there's, I mean, the stuff that they're being taught. And it's being taught right now in California and several other states right now. Don't think it's just because it's in other states, it's coming here. Because right here in Fayette County, there's an ordinance that has passed that makes it illegal for Christian counselors to counsel regarding gender issues. I have put together um, what I'm calling a green sheet. <laughs> and it's an information sheet to engage, you know, you're ready yet. And on this, there's the website for register to vote. If you aren't registered to vote, you need to get registered to vote. Your vote's important. All you have to do is go to that website and it'll walk you through it. There's a website for your state legislators in Frankfurt. There's a legislative message line that you can call. If you don't know who your, reg your uh, representatives or senators are, you can call this number. They'll tell you who they are. They'll connect you with who they are. And you can leave a message that you want to uh, pass on to them. It has the numbers for our state websites and phone numbers for our United States senators and representatives. It has uh, a list of uh, Christian political update groups so it will keep you updated on the true news so that you can pray uh, knowingly. But there's also... I didn't get on here, this particular group, a call to the wall, 24-7 National Strategic Prayer Call. And you can call that number, and then that's the code to get in. And you can pray anytime with somebody. I haven't done it yet. I just found out about it. That's why it's not on the sheet. But I want you to know that. You know, Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. And I urge you to set aside some time to lift up concentrated prayer, whether it be alone or preferably with somebody else. You know, I believe today is a divine appointment for many of you here, here today. I wasn't on the preaching schedule to preach this Sunday. I was supposed to preach next Sunday. <laughs> but God wanted to alert some of you to his call to be on your knees for this country this Thursday, united in prayer with people across our nation. And then also, the primary elections are coming up on May 22nd. So if you're not registered to vote, you're not going to be able to, but I urge you to find out if you are registered to vote, I, I, I urge you to find out who is on the ballot, what their platforms are, not necessarily what they're espousing in the public media. Check them out and vote on those that are upholding biblical values. If you are not registered yet, I urge you to do so because November is coming. <laughs> and the website, again, to, for registration is on that green sheet. You know, there are 90 Muslims running for key offices across our country this year in our November election. And their intent is to have Sharia law. And if you don't think that's scary, you need to look up what Sharia law is and what they're wanting to bring to our country. We have got to stand up. We have got to repent, change our minds about politics and our role in protecting our country. You know, uh, but <laughs> don't start praying until you do. 
don't start praying until that's been taken care of. Because that repentance, you know, that God-intended feeling that moves our hearts back to God, it's not a work of the flesh or of the ego. It's a result of God's Spirit stirring our conscience. It slams the wrong door shut so that our prayers are not coming out of anger or frustration, revenge, judgment, obedience, or offensiveness, bitterness. We don't want our prayers coming up out of that mess, out of our, out of our soul, about what our minds may have been filled or our emotions or whatever. We want to pray out of our spirits. We want to pray according to God's will. We want to pray for, for these people, not God take their head off and send them to hell. We want to pray prayers that are coming from a clean heart, a heart that shut the door to all the lies of the enemy and the chaos of the circumstances that's gone into that throne room to be a scepter. Praying out of the Father's heart to bless, encourage, direct, and forgive. Praying for godly revelation, wisdom, and strategy for these people. Pray for perfect laborers to come across their path, perhaps their family members to give a voice to truth and peace and righteousness. Pray for their protection. Pray for their forgiveness. You know, Stephen, when he was being stoned by the Pharisees, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The majority of people that are so up and at them, they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. They're believing that uh, mind control that's coming through the media, the lies. We need to be praying prayers, trusting that God is in control and that he's hearing our prayers, that they're powerful to the tearing down of strongholds, and that he loves them. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it says, And pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. Pray for them. Bless them. We're going to reap what we sow. We're reaping what we've sown. Now we're repenting and we're going to reap what we sow. Intercede, church. Intercede. Pray for President Trump and those in office in D.C. It doesn't matter what you think about him. He's the president of our country. And I challenge you to read Isaiah 45 and pray that over him because he's our 45th president and he is our Cyrus. As you read that, it opens some eyes. Pray for Governor Bevin and those in office in Frankfurt. Okay, he's not perfect. He doesn't have a lot of good people skills in some ways. He's the governor of our state. God's word says, pray for him. Pray for your mayors. Pray for your city councilors. You know who they are? I'm ashamed to tell you, I don't know who all mine are. I know a few of them. I'm going to find out so that I can pray for them. Ephesians 6, um, 10 through 18. I'm just coming in one moment. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. I've got to hurry up. <laughs> um, now, my beloved ones, I have saved the most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Remember, light, energy, power. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies and of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand your -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor of God that he provides so that you'll be protected as you confront, as you confront the slander. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Put on truth as the belt to strengthen your stand in triumph. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. Stand on your feet alert, and then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it's able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of the salvation's full deliverance. Uh, like the helmet to protect your thoughts from lies and take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Pray passionately in the spirit as you, can see, you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Pray the blessings of God upon all believers. Would you stand with me, please?
Father, we thank you for your word. Jonathan, I'm going to ask, well, he's not in here. He left. <laughs> I was going to ask him to, to play. But, excuse me. Father, we thank you for your word, for the light, the power, the life, the authority, the courage, and the strategy that you've bestowed upon us to partner with you in your plans and purposes for this world. We thank you, Father, for clearing the atmosphere and the, the airwaves. We thank you for the gift of repentance that enables us to realign our hearts with yours. We lift up others who are opposing your ways, and we ask you to forgive them as well, for they know not what they are doing. Lord, we love you, and we count it a privilege to stand in the gap for others. I ask you for your anointing now in these simple green sheets that our receiving them will be an outward symbol of our willingness to contend for each other, our state, our nation, especially for Governor Bevan and our President of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And by the way, that it's not a meaningless magic word phrase in Jesus' name. It's loosing the full authority of the king. So I'm going to invite the altar team to come forward in a few minutes. But first, I want to give you an opportunity before the Lord to come forward and receive a green sheet, indicating that to the best of your ability, as the Holy Spirit leads, you will be faithful to pray for our government leaders, obedient to vote, and keep your heart and mind open to other means of building the kingdom. So you are free to come. I've got them here on the floor. There are three different places where they are. And as you come, know that you're not coming to please me. You are coming because you are taking the opportunity to declare before the Lord that you will pray for our country, that you will contend for each other, for our state, for our nation, for our governor, and for our president. And I have, you know, we're praying right now for the Lord's anointing upon these, that they not be like any other sheet of paper that you pick up at the information table. But they will be a constant present with you. Stick them in your Bible. Stick them someplace where you are every day. That you may be reminded that God is calling you to do this. He has this for you. He's got, this is your assignment. Hashtag, you're it. <laughs> You're it. And I also have, uh, you know, physically taken um, anointing oil and prayed over these last night and anointed them with oil. <laughs> so if there's a little, there may show up on some of them. There, some of them it might just be on the ridge. But, you know, they've been taken before the throne of God. And I honestly believe with all my heart, and evidently you do too, that this is his call to us personally that we can make a difference. In Jesus' name, the power of his spirit, blood of his lamb. So right now, I uh, invite the altar team to come forward if you have other things on your hearts and, and minds in your lives that you would like to, to have prayed over. And, um, and I'll be sticking around as well. And if you have any other uh, desire for any more information in any of these areas, I have got files full, <laughs> and I would be glad to uh, join. And by the way, if you happen to be from Jesmond County, we have a Jesmond County prayer call every Monday morning at 9 o'clock where we pray for Jesmond County. It would be wonderful if somebody took up the, the mantle and did it for Fayette County and whatever county you're from. But, but God's on the move, and we get to be part of it. Amen. Amen. We might feel like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by him. <laughs>